Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Roman gardens. But first, a couple of Patreon patrons to thank. First of all, thank you to Dan Pugh of Bunny Trails, Will Fox of Exploring History on YouTube, and the folks at Lexitecture. Thank you all so much. And thank you to Emma Polly, who's been editing and transcribing the interviews recently. Now, today we're talking to Victoria Austin on a topic very appropriate for the spring weather and activities going on right now. Gardens. So Vicky has a PhD from King's College London and has been teaching at the University of Winnipeg since 2019, where she'll also be teaching next year. After that, she's going to be heading to the U.S. to become the Odin Postdoctoral Fellow in Innovation in the Humanities within the Classics Department at Carleton College. Congratulations. Her most recent publication is Columella's Prose Preface, a paratextual reading of De Re Rustica Book 10 in Selectica Classica. Her work focuses on Roman landscapes and gardens, as well as mythological narratives and race and ethnicity in the ancient world. So without any further ado, let's talk to Vicky. So hi, Vicky. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is a pleasure to talk about gardens today. <laughs> as we approach, we're depending when this goes out, it may or may not still be true, but we're in the spring and gardens are very much on all of our minds. Yes, growing absolutely. Things, finally. Indeed. So let's start there with, that is one of your primary research interests is yep. gardens in, in the ancient world. So maybe you can talk about where you came to that interest from. We often ask people about interesting connections in their lives. And one of the places that often comes up is where you know, what coincidences or seeming fate drove you to the things you're interested yeah. in talking about? No, absolutely. Well, I think I should make really clear to begin with that, and this is a question that people kind of ask me all of the time. I say I'm researching gardens and they say, oh, well, you must be a really keen gardener in reality. Mm -hmm. And I have to very gently let them down and say, well, actually, I cannot even keep a single plant alive. Um, so this is, this is, I have to kind of say, it's purely from a very theoretical standpoint that I am good at or interested in gardens. Anytime I have tried to do anything practical, it's like, okay, this is where my expertise ends. So yeah, so very much on the, on the theoretical side. But in terms of, I suppose, how I came to the garden, specifically the ancient Roman garden in my research, during my masters at King's College London I started looking at Marshall's epigrams and mm. I was really interested in the space of the city so a lot of Marshall's poems are all based on the city space and his opinion of the city and then that feeds into a larger conversation in Latin literature about this contrast between the city and also the country and each of those two polar opposites have various ideological kind of associations with them. And then when I was thinking about how to move that forward and thinking about, oh, well, these spaces are really interesting and we have that dynamic and oppositional city versus countryside. But then I started thinking, well, what about spaces that are neither one of those things that don't really fit into either one of those categories really neatly? And that's basically how I came to garden space because, you know, gardens can be everywhere and anywhere and they're in this weird grey kind of space between the city and the country because they're green, but they're also cultivated. There's this wild versus tame mm -hmm. idea and, and all of those things. So, yeah, I really came at it from thinking about in the literature what different spaces can mean to different writers, particularly those ambiguous spaces that don't fit into neat categories. And, yeah, and then as I'm sure all PhD students know you start off with an idea and I thought well gardens will maybe be one chapter or half a chapter or you know a little thing in in the research and then it ended up being the entire research project so that's that's <laughs> how I came to gardens in the first place. Yeah there's, I find this even with undergraduate students or especially with undergraduate students they always think that 
you know, here's a topic, but I don't know if there'll be enough yes. in that topic <laughs> to write about a whole essay on. Yeah. And I always think, no, no, child, what you yeah. will find, and I do not say that out loud because it would be deeply patronizing if yeah. I did, but is that what you will find, in fact, is every topic you think is maybe not big enough for a paper is actually too big for a dissertation. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and in my thesis, it's basically centered around six key state key case studies, which are as three pairs basically but I could have picked six completely different case studies and still like uh, it was really hard to choose them and again yeah you think oh is there going to be enough here is this is this too niche and then you realize no there is nothing (laughs) definitely (laughs) not not niche enough (laughs) enough. and then it's like oh now we've got to narrow and narrow and narrow it down so yes I think I think this is you know part part of the course for all PhD journey mm-hmm. so yeah I, I certainly went through that <laughs> is this enough to oh this is too much and how do I cut it down to to to, to my chapters so yeah especially when you have like a, a topic or an image like that that is so ripe for m- metaphorical yeah uh, mm-hmm. interpretation and actually no, that's a terrible pun right oh I, yeah, I, I was I, lived, I was <laughs> gonna try to ignore it but so many of my sentences in my research and when I'm talking about it I I find myself saying oh we're gonna dig into this or we're yeah. rooting <laughs> for something and then I I realize I've done it I'm not even intending to but it is as you said it is right <laughs> for for <laughs> interpretation so it's yeah it's really far too easy to make those puns and yeah even when I don't think I'm doing it I then read something back and I notice another one so great (laughs) so okay let me ask you then what I'm going to bet is one of the hardest questions when you were making your thesis is how do you define a garden yeah so this is basically (laughs) the question that I began my study with I thought well you know, you think when I'm doing my thesis, you've got to define your terms and be very Mm -hmm. clear about what you're talking about. So I was like, first of all, I need to come up with my own definition of what a garden is. And I thought, well, this would be straightforward, right? You know, everyone knows what a garden is, but turns out that actually makes it really, really difficult because Mm -hmm. we become so familiar with these spaces and we can implicitly recognize them. But then if someone asks you to come up with this set of you know, very definitive set of characteristics for that space, it actually turns out that it's really, really hard. And I spent a long time at the beginning of my research looking at, you know, I I think thousands of (laughs) garden definitions, and they really do range from, you know, especially if you look at different time periods, different cultures, it it Mm -hmm. is a really kind of broad set of characteristics. But I really it seemed that there were always these two key characteristics that kept cropping up across all of them. And that was this sense of cultivation, obviously, Mm -hmm. because you're taking nature and trying to turn it into something for a particular purpose, you know, whether that be growing food in a very practical sense, or you want to grow some really nice flowers to look at, you know, there's always this Mm -hmm. sense of cultivation in some sense. And then spatially, obviously that's something I'm really interested in, there was also this sense of boundedness or being set aside in some way for a particular purpose. And that boundary can come in a very physical form. You know, we think of a white picket fence in the modern imagination. So yeah, these two ideas of boundedness and cultivation, that idea that it's set aside for a particular reason, that's those two ideas seem to be the two things that held all of these various interpretations together. And just, so I I kind of honed in on those two as my, Mm -hmm. as my key focal points. What about the, the concept of enclosure? Is that necessary to define a garden? Yeah. So from from my perspective, and this is basically my entire thesis, is that I'm saying that, yes, we define them intrinsically by a sense of enclosure or boundedness. But at the same time, we, especially for the Romans, and this is obviously my area of speciality, they almost set up these boundaries specifically in order to then deconstruct them or play with them in some way in order to have that play between the spaces between these idea of opposites obviously I spoke about city and countryside in order to play with those polar opposites you have to have 
that defining line to begin with in order to play with it. So it, it seems like they intentionally set these boundaries up in order to then in some way make us question what that boundary is doing and what it means and in terms of physical access, you know, metaphorical, ideological concerns. And yeah, that's something that, you know, we want to think about across the board. And yeah, you basically pinpointed my entire thesis there in that question. <laughs> <laughs> so so would, would uh, a peristyle then count as a garden if yes. it had, you know, cultivation in it? I mean, I think that's what I'm, I'm just going to jump in before you yeah. answer that in more fully and in, with actual knowledge. But I would bet that if you asked anyone who's generally studied the ancient Rome, that if you said Roman garden, that is what they would think that's of. That the peristyle yeah. is okay. the peristyle garden is like the typical the Roman garden for, yeah. for me. A hundred percent. And yeah, that is, I think when people have an image, if they do, of a Roman garden, you think of that domestic peristyle garden. We define that for those. Yeah, so so basically a peristyle garden is um, a garden mostly located kind of in a central-ish space in a domestic house. We see this a lot in Pompeii and Herculaneum, and this is probably why it's captured our imagination so much. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a central kind of courtyarded space where all of the plants and the flowers are in the center. And then it's surrounded by colonnaded portico and often with columns around it. And that's where you get this idea of the peristyle from because peristyle really refers to that architectural surround but then it's become a byword for the entire garden space so I think when people have this image of a Roman garden that tends to be the default space that they're imagining but more that I look into it you know this is only one type of garden space mm. and that idea of the peristyle garden just in the terminology that's more of a modern invention you know Vitruvius does use the term peristyle a few times, but he uses it interchangeably with a host of lots and lots of different terms. And it's really, I think it was in the, in the 19, about 1920 or something, um, a German scholar really first came up with this idea of the peristyle garden as this overarching term. And then it was picked up in the 1940s by Grimal, who's a famous French scholar on Roman gardens. And, and it's really only since then that that's become this byword for kind of all Roman domestic gardens when actually that's only one very specific type in, in the Roman imagination. Right. Maybe that's a good place to ask you, you know, we always like to pretend that we are still occasionally a, a podcast about language, even when we're really interested in other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to make that connection. Yeah. Um, what are the sort of, main terms what are the main latin words that mean garden yeah in any kind of or that could be used to mean garden yeah so the basic word for garden in latin is hortus and that is the basic term that you know if you looked up in a latin dictionary it, it would come up with that term this is where the complexity really starts because it soon becomes very apparent when you look at the literature that that is only one of many many terms and each term has its own you know, different ideological connotations. So mm -hmm. although hortus in our modern conception has become this byword for, oh, that means garden in Latin, it's actually really only referring to the very basic traditional vegetable plot, essentially, in, right. in the Roman literature. The, ki the kitchen garden, yeah. exactly. So this idea that you would have a little garden at the back of your house in order to grow vegetables, maybe have some flowers, um, but the flowers would still be fairly practical because you'd use them uh, for religious purposes in garlands and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, very much that idea of self-sufficiency and it's a productive space. It's there for growing your own uh, produce in order to sustain yourself and then maybe if you're lucky and you have a surplus then you may be able to sell some of it and just to jump in there yeah that's the word what's the sorry moving us uh, out of latin for a second yeah greek yes the word for growing things like even now if you just mean like greens for your food 
It's korta, right? Yeah. So, and also, and kortos in in the Greek is the Greek term primarily used um, as a space, an enclosed space used for growing food right. or okay. or fodder. It, it's mostly used in the Greek. The terms primarily used in relation to animals. So, I think in Homer, it's used to designate kind of an area in the courtyard where the cattle were kept. So okay. there's that kind of idea with the produce from the space mostly linked to that livestock. Whereas in the Roman, obviously from that, we then get hortus. In that sense, in the Latin sense, it seems more about domestic space and food production for people as opposed to right. animals. That seems to be the main distinction. But both of both terms have this idea of it's a kind of enclosed domestic space used for productive ish reasons right so coming back to the 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 peristyle then yeah. that that is a really interesting situation of you know it's in terms of its enclosure it's both inside and outside yeah in really important ways yeah absolutely so this is something that really fascinates me because of the interplay between the inside and outside and off often in this in slightly later houses when the idea is more fully thought through and houses are actually designed specifically with this peristyle garden in mind. They tend to be in this very central location in the house. So you have to, they're almost like a transitional space. You've got to either move through it or go around it to get to various elements of the house. And as you said, so then structurally, it's very much interiorized, I suppose, by the surrounding bits of the domestic space, but it's still open to the air. So it's outside. Yeah, that play on inside and outside is something that we see not just in the archaeological evidence in areas like a peristyle garden, but we also see in descriptions of gardens, I'm thinking of Pliny the Younger's Villa Letters. He has lots of descriptions of his gardens. Many of them he really highlights that play between inside and outside ideas of, you know, you have a painting on a wall inside of, you know, a nice landscape scene. And then it essentially is like coming to life because it seamlessly blends into the actual plants on the outside of the room. And so you've got this idea that, yes, they're separated in some way, but they, they become very integral to the domestic space. And yet they're also outside and interiorized. And yeah, I find that it's really interesting. And again, that also brings into the discussion, this debate of public versus private space in a mm. house as well. Because, you know, who's going there? When are they going there? Who, who gets access to it? And when and why? And all of those associated questions. So we did interrupt. Do you want to come back to that? Yeah. But we interrupted you or... I interrupted you in <laughs> talking about what the what the Latin yeah. terms are. So we have hortus. Yeah. What are the other terms that get used? Then? Yeah. So hortus in the plural is horti. That actually means something entirely different. Um, so <laughs> so that the transition from that singular to plural form, you know, in, on a very basic level, does seem to mark this shift from that productive space in the singular hortus to a more aesthetic type space mm -hmm. for pleasure in the plural horti. I would think of horti more like a grand public park, you know, the big right. kind of gardens in the center of Rome owned by, you know, Julius Caesar had his own horti, uh, Pompey did as well, Mycenas had his own gardens, those type of kind of big you know, landscaped areas in the city, again, they are, they are, they tend to be termed haughty in the plural. And they're very much, you know, they've moved very much away from that original productive connotations. And so I, I think, I think we in a modern sense would think of them more like public parks. But yeah, in, in the Latin haughty in the plural signifies these kind of grand ostentatious pleasure gardens in many ways. To be fair, that's true in English too, even yeah. in, as you've been talking about it. I have a garden, but I yeah. would go to the gardens. Yes, exactly. The gar you know, the, the, there are many gardens and yeah. I would always think of those as being public spaces, yeah. very heavily managed and ornamental that yeah. are meant as places for people to, for rec recreation to happen. Yeah, exactly. But I would right. not say that I have, even though I have two gardens, one in the front and the back, I wouldn't call them my gardens. Yeah. But, you oh, know, it would, it would mean something different. I haven't even thought of that. Yeah. yeah, probably because as I said, I, I cannot garden. So I've never thought yeah. of that <laughs> distinction myself. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That yeah. this distinction between 
And I like what you said about the recreational aspect, because I think Mm -hmm. these larger, open, slightly more public spaces, and again, we have this interesting um, divide between public and private space and you know, mm-hmm. controlled uh, access, controlled, but, yeah, all of these but kind not of ideas. intimate. Yeah. yeah. And I think that recreational aspect and pleasure, that's mm-hmm. very much haughty in the plural. And, right. you know, mm-hmm. in many ways, and kind of alongside haughty is another term for these grander public spaces in particularly the city of Rome, and that's porticus. Yes. And, you know, we have, for example, porticus livii, and these are essentially, again, kind of enclosed spaces, kind of a grand public scale version of a peristyle garden in that you have a large green or landscaped recreational pleasure space in the center, and then it's surrounded in some way by a portico, hence porticus, very much modeled on the Greek kind of gymnasia idea that you've got this central space for recreation and then it's it's framed by the architecture around around it for strolling about in the exactly, shade for promenade yeah. for promenading if you if you did promenade in in ancient rome you would probably be doing it in a porticus so yes mm-hmm. <laughs> so horty and porticus then they imply a kind of civic function since they're not private well, what about like a religious function? What would you, how would you refer to that kind of garden space? Yeah, so religion, uh, the kind of religious aspect of gardens is something that I'm particularly interested in because especially in the Roman evidence that I've looked at, there's a really interesting intersection, I suppose, between garden space and sacred space in general in that they share the idea of being set aside for a particular purpose you know mm-hmm. you get and again boundedness either literal or metaphorical in some way that idea of you know you've entered into something different and you know you've crossed a line somehow into a different kind of space and so with that in mind I think it's probably unsurprising that gardens do feature a lot in many sacred or religious contexts so in a domestic setting Loraria, which are kind of your basic shrine that you would have in your house in Pompeii, I think it's something like almost a third of them are found in garden spaces. So it seems that Mm. it's a very popular location for these um, Loraria for, you know, your family, I suppose your family shrine day to day religious practice. Tomb gardens are also a very, very popular thing and also planted temple enclosures. So this idea um, that you have a garden alongside a tomb, alongside a sacred space. There does seem to be quite a lot of greenery associated with those sacred ideas. So yeah, in that sense, I think there is a lot of crossover. And because of that emphasis on boundedness, I think that for one makes these two things go well together. And then also in the Roman imagination, you know, they're very deep seated religious kind of sacred ideas there's a lot of tie in with agriculture and, you know, the idea of the Lucas, which is like a sacred grove. And so you have mm-hmm. all of these overlaps. And I, you know, there is a quite a lot of debate in scholarship about these types of tomb gardens or sacred groves, whether we deal with those under the umbrella of garden space or if it's sacred space or if it's both or or neither Mm -hmm. you know it's its own and I kind of fall on the side that we can term these sacred spaces as garden space but at the same time we have to think about how the sacred and the garden elements kind of intersect with one another so again boundaries again (laughs) yeah because because that's that's really interesting the the Lucas or that there's so many Mm. There's a fair number, especially of when you talk about the native, yeah. in quotes, but the yeah. the more Rome, the more Italian rather than the imported yes. stuff. So much of that is tied to landscape. So much of the t- those are tied to a spring or a grove, yeah. and they are also there's a weird or an interesting liminality there because they're notionally wild, right? Yes. Those are wild spaces yeah. in in the the origin stories of it, or yeah. at least my understanding of the sort of sacredness of those spaces, are they, yeah. you know, you think of the Aeneid and, and Latinus going, because I only think in literature because I yeah. don't know what they think about real life, <laughs> but, you know, you think about Latinus going out to, to sleep in the grove and get his his prophetic dream. Yeah, The whole point is you're going outside of the city into the wild. It's not a cultivated space, but at the same time, it is a managed space because there's a shrine there and yeah. it's a set aside 
religious space. So if you're going to have a Lucas that goes along with a temple by the time of, say, Republican Rome, it's almost yeah. certainly going to actually be a very cultivated space. But, but does it hold any, does it still hold on to a sense of being a wild space? Exactly. You know, that it's not productive in that same way that isn't meant to be used or wasn't planted or by or whatever, managed by humans in the same way. Yeah, and actually, this is kind of once I've finished my current research project, what I want to, <laughs> this is something that I kind of touched on a little bit in my PhD that's now been developed into a monograph. But this idea of particularly, I looked at the Augustan period and the and Augustus' mm -hmm. use of green space in the city and this overlap of the sacred and the profane and all of these kind of things. I think that idea of the Lucas, you know, do we think of that as a garden or was it originally, as you said, that kind of, it's, it's sort of wild, but then at some point they do become in the maintenance of these spaces, you may have identified mm -hmm. it initially as, oh, well, this is just kind of sprung from the earth naturally, and this is just a beautiful space. But the minute you start maintaining it as that space, it, is that the mm -hmm. point that it becomes a garden? I find that really fascinating. And particularly in the Augustan period, where if you look at kind of domestic wall painting as well, you get this whole genre of the kind of sacral idyllic type scene that is very right. much like a Lucas, you know, these kind of floating panels where you've got this sense that there's maybe a big old tree and there's maybe a few shepherds or rustic figures, a little temple or a statue that they're worshipping at the side. Is this meant to be do we class this as a garden painting? Is it something else? Like, where does that mm -hmm. kind of sacral idyllic and garden space, I find that a really, really interesting overlap. And how do we, dis where's the line between those two things? Like how, how much cultivation is enough cultivation for, mm -hmm. for, for it to kind of transition into that gardeny definition, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And we get back here to that original problem of defining you know it's the it's the is this hot dog a sandwich problem <laughs> yeah everybody knows what it is or what it isn't but yeah. that actually is where the where the boundaries are yeah are, and, are exactly. hardest. and i and i've really come to the conclusion when i've been researching guns it's much easier to say what one is not than actually what one is because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah. well it's it's not that it's not wild uh, it's not this it's not that but then when mm -hmm. you're actually trying to say what it is that's really difficult. And kind of thinking about that shared, if we're thinking about words and terms as well, with this overlap between sacred and garden space, the Latin colere, you know, we can, that's where we get cult and cultivate from. And there's that mm -hmm. shared association of, you know, it can be translated as to worship or to cultivate. So mm -hmm. just in the very language, you've got those two meanings bound together in the same word idea of cultic and cultivation so yeah I find find that there's just so much to be said and I think it's a really under appreciated element of, of kind of language and, and there just seems to be so much evidence of this kind of uh, sacral idyllic space in the Roman mm -hmm. imagination but I don't think I, I don't think it's been approached so much from the kind of garden angle in right. scholarship before. So I, I think that's, again, pun, a productive angle to, to kind of tackle it from. So when I think about what I, looking at literature, because I know you started yeah. from Latin poetry, yeah. you've gone elsewhere, but of course that's where my mind goes too. Yeah. So the horti, the, the gardens, definitely feature. I mean, in Augustan poetry, there's yes. a number of places where they feature in various ways. I know in other later literature, and you already mentioned Pliny, he's the a big place where this turns up you have the villa garden or the yes. garden space connected with the so this is outside of the city so you're already outside of the city yeah but then there's a villa and then there's the there's a notional distinction between the productive the, not necessarily an actual distinction but a notional distinction between the productive parts of a villa or the yeah. or a productive villa and a, a villa for recreation. And I want to come back to the terms that would be used for that in a moment. But is there a specific garden term? Like, would that those gardens 
would anything at the villa be called a hortus? Would there be would the recreational ones? Is there a specific term for that? Because that's might be a peristyle garden, but it's yeah. it's also something much more than that. Yeah. So if we, if we take Pliny's um, villa letters mm-hmm. as, as an example, he does use the term hortus once. I think it's once across the two main ones are his letter two seventeen and five six. They're they're the okay. two two his two main ones, and in two seventeen he does use the term. Hortus, and it is mm-hmm. very, very specifically used in that productive original vegetable garden right. type way. All the other times that he mentions green spaces, he doesn't use haughty and he doesn't use hortus again. This is where Pliny, being very Pliny, if you've read any Pliny, he just brings <laughs> in like a whole host of predominantly Greek terms to kind of to to complicate your life (laughs) yes you know so things like zeistus for example these are very like obscure greek mostly again architectural terms and then he's kind of Mm. using them to and this is where the liminality aspect comes from because it's like is he referring to the architectural structure around the space or is this like the whole space that he's talking about it's really Mm. really difficult and challenging to and and one of the things that's frustrating is when you try and map the terms that we see in literature to the spaces that we see in the archaeological evidence, like they don't necessarily map on neatly to one another. And particularly Pliny, I think, you know, and this is very much something that he does in general, he's using specific terms to reflect on his personality. So these kind of Greekisms, this is all about showing himself to be, you know, a very educated scholarly man. And it's all about trying to evoke that kind of ancient Greek philosophical association with the garden. So it's really, and because we don't have a ton of comparable literature with these extended Mm -hmm. Villa Garden garden references, it's really hard to tell, you know, is it just Pliny that's using these terms? Or is this like a, (laughs) is this a Plinyism? Is the, are these widespread? Is he just trying to show off, you know, how unique are the terms that he uses? And yeah, I think that's one of the frustrating things about the literature and that we have a whole host of terminology. One, it doesn't necessarily neatly map onto the kind of material evidence, but also mm. words are used, terms are used in different ways by different people. So mm. interchange, it's the interchangeability of these terms that really annoys me when I'm looking at the language. Because, you know, sometimes they'll use villa to denote, especially in legal texts, they'll use villa to denote the kind of the entire complex. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's very specifically divided, like villa will just note like the actual buildings versus you'll then have farmland that will be a different term sometimes you know villa and gardens are interchangeable and and so you know it's Mm -hmm. never really they can't even seem to they can't even seem to be unambiguous um in the terminology (laughs) which you would think in legal stuff would be clear because they're very there's you know lots of boundary disputes about you know villas and stuff in in Mm -hmm. legal text but it's never really clear I find when I'm looking at these descriptions of domestic spaces where one type of space begins and where one type of space ends, they all seem to flow into one another. And I think that makes it really hard to kind of delineate then ideologically what each space is supposed to mean if if they're all flowing into one another. And I guess we, I mean, just in terms of the terminology of that, we we kind of have a reflection of that in the English terms that come from Latin, Mm. like horticulture and agriculture are very different, but there's no clear. But yeah, where you actually, where you draw the line between Mm -hmm. those things is not clear. You can see at the the extremes that these are different things. Yeah, but there's the the semantic fields have different centers. That's not Mm -hmm. a problem, but their edges are are very, very overlapping. And, And this is something that is grappled with that very boundary between horticulture and architecture an agriculture sorry but also architecture uh, but horticulture <laughs> and agriculture as you said where those two spheres meet and how they're related to one another is something that exp- is explored in latin authors virgil's georgics for example mm-hmm. and also columella's big agricultural treatise these are two texts that i work with a lot they both discuss gardens in their agricultural treatise 
treaties, but they do it in this way and they are constantly grappling with the idea of, well, does the garden belong in my agricultural text in some way? And they're both kind of saying the same thing. It's like, well, it belongs, but it doesn't really belong. Virgil kind of deals with this by saying, well, if I had time to speak about gardens, then I'd tell this really nice story about an old man in his garden. And then kind of like 40 lines later, he goes, but I don't have time for that. So I'm just going to skip on to the next thing and I'll leave it to someone else to decide. And then Columella in his text very much picks up that challenge and says, well, Virgil said someone else should talk about gardens. So I'm going to do that. But even when he talks about it, he still grapples in his introduction with this idea of, well, some people say that this kind of topic doesn't really belong here, but I'm going to include it anyway. And then he talks about it almost as being like a bonus, or he uses financial language to signify that in some way, this is like an interest payment as part of his agricultural text. So it's this idea mm. of, yeah, it's a nice to have, maybe, but it doesn't quite neatly fit into agriculture. So yeah, as you said, that divide between horticulture and agriculture, we see that now. And it's something that the ancient Latin writers also grappled with all the, all the way back then as well. So when I think about garden versus, so there's the hortus, the kitchen garden yeah. complicates this. So yeah. let me ignore it for a moment. <laughs> yes, you may. How, <laughs> how I deal with those sorts of problems. But when I think of a garden, and this really is true of both the horti and the porticus that you were talking about, and then also the villa garden, the ideological sort of underpinnings of all of those are leisure, right? Yes. It's o- otium. They are a place of otium. And yeah. the, the porticus, for instance, something like Livia's porticus uh, stands in specific contrast to a forum. Yeah. You have There are two places you can go to gather and meet and have social contact. But one is the forum, which is for business, whether legal or commercial. And one is a porticus, which is where you go to have social. And of course, those divisions don't actually work. Yeah. That's (laughs) one of the reasons that women go to the port, you know, why and why Livia has a portica, yeah. porticus and not a forum. You have a forum Augusti and you have the porticus Livia. I know you know all of this. Yeah. <laughs> right. it it's a really interesting yeah. uh, masculine feminine divide there as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we, we know that like if women were going to go and walk and meet their friends, a place they would do that would be in a porticus because they don't belong in a forum. A respectable women uh, don't belong in the forum by and large. I know the minute I say a sentence like that, there's like a whole bunch of exceptions that yeah. you, made, you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, I, know. I know what you As mean. As a yeah. general ideological. In general, idea, yeah. I mean. So the the one context in which I have dealt at all with the gardens in this is in that idea of this philosoph like what Pliny is so concerned about, that idea of philosophical otium, um, of the leisure that that Horace too is is so concerned with. Uh, he doesn't bring when he does talk about gardens, it's in a different context. But one could imagine, one I think ought to imagine him in a garden much of the time when he's doing his drinking and yes. <laughs> enjoying. He just doesn't necessarily talk about it explicitly. Yeah, but he's in a you know he's often in a natural setting, and we know he's not on a like in the woods or <laughs> sitting next to a field of oats. Yeah. So one assumes he is indeed in a garden. Same with Tobolus when yeah. he imagines himself on his farm. Yes, it's a farm, but it's going to be mostly a villa. And yeah. it's gonna be, so this idea of OTM, is that like leaving aside the kitchen garden, as I said, but when Romans, like, is that an important part then of what distinguishes a garden so if you're talking about horticulture versus agriculture, is that what part of what, because you said your initial dis, dis, uh, definition was that it's a space set aside, you know, cultivated yeah. and set aside for a purpose. But of course, that could describe a farm. Yep. And so is is it important that that purpose be in some way connected to leisure? I think... If you set aside the kitchen garden. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah definitely. I think that it's... As you, you've, you've really kind of hit the nail on the head that there are other spaces that, like mm-hmm. a farm, that fit that idea of it's set aside for a particular purpose, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it's there's something then, as you said, ideological about that transition from being outside of a garden into inside of a garden. But there's <laughs> what complicates it is there's this range of associations as to what, you know, what is it? What mm-hmm. is that purpose? You know, what what do we do there? I think particularly in the city of Rome and these types of spaces that you're talking about, that idea of otium is really intrinsic and it can be both a positive and a negative. So right. it's particularly in the late Republic and this idea of, you know, the fall of the Republic and the decline, you know, 
mm-hmm. ancient and modern kind of scholars have often kind of viewed that shift from you know that very productive traditional sense to oh we're now going for pleasure as you said or leisure it Mm -hmm. fits into that general very moralizing roman discourse that you get of this idea that oh well we've like descended into this luxuria and this is you know it could be terrible so gardens have this really interesting place in that debate because i think they can be kind of pushed one way or the other so we do see lots of examples of people using gardens as kind of examples of like invective against people that have gone too far in the kind of leisure and pleasure idea this idea of it's you know becomes an unnatural almost a perversion of nature if you're pushing it too far but then you have someone like Pliny who clearly wants to create this idea and linking it more to those philosophical, very learned, a literary type of leisure. And that's very positive mm-hmm. for his own kind of self-presentation. So yes, I think this idea of leisure or pleasure as well, and otium, really, really intrinsic if we kind of ignore the vegetable garden idea, but that leisure can be both a positive and a negative. And we see kind of varying examples and and it's a very fine line, I think, between those two things because, Mm -hmm. you know, at what point does it become too much and there's there's a lot of that idea of fertility and abundance is good but only up until a point you know you've got to harness that in some way because then if it becomes too much then it becomes you know perverse and then it's going over the top and it's almost morally suspect that you're then playing with nature too much. So yeah, you kind of get these examples in Tacitus with Messalina and Agrippina in the annals. He he very much sees gardens as this these places of, you know, perverse kind of power plays. And this is where, you know, bad things happen. And then in, in Statius's letters about villas as well, he has a lot of warnings about how if you're doing too much to nature, then you make it unnatural that you can you should only cultivate it kind of enough because if you're mm. then creating these kind of mon- monstrous villa complexes then you're actually kind of ruining nature or spoiling it in some way so i think with that leisure it really on otm it really brings into question that idea of well how much leisure is morally acceptable how much pleasure is morally acceptable and and where do you and where do these spaces factor into that discussion? Yeah, I mean, this is this is such a, a that whole, there's such a, a nexus there of so yeah. many things that are going on in the late Republic onward. I mean, probably before that too, but we really see it in the literature of the late Republic. And then, and then the um, retrospective discussion of the late Republic that happens in yeah. the early imperial period with Otium. Is Otium idleness? Yeah. Or is it philosophy? Exactly. And, and then the... Otium as a an important marker of status because only, yeah, only if you're wealthy do you have otium. <laughs> yes, so exactly. To not have to not have otium is definitely the mark of a of a person you know a person you don't want to be. Yeah, but where do you draw that line? And then, you know the the argument between the Epicurean and the Stoic approaches to such things, etc. Yeah. And yeah, the gardens. I mean, I know there's the you know I, I don't know how much you do talk about fish ponds in your gardens, but I know the fish ponds are the are the one of the pieces of invective that you get all the time, like. It's those fish ponds. Yeah. That's where they really yeah. broke with the boundaries <laughs> of nature. That's when they started growing those huge fish yeah. and, and it, caring for their fish more than for humans and yeah, pretending it, they had oceans in their own backyards. Yeah. That's when we knew we were all going downhill. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of this idea that when you're fish ponds are bad. When you're yeah, taking it too far. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I look at in my research is how how Augustus and the kind of Augustan use of green space in the city really grapples with that idea and arguably he's very successful in harnessing it in a positive way because Mm -hmm. you see and I I use this idea of all of this idea of the golden age and there being this abundant growth and you know everything's blooming and you know it's all great in the Augustan (laughs) period and he very much kind of but but then there's this emphasis on okay it's kind of 
tamed profusion in some way. Like everything is fully blooming, but at the same time, there is some level of control over it. And, and that control, it, it's subtle, but it's just enough there to kind of harness the potential. And I think one really obvious example of this kind of visually is if you look at the Arapakis, the big altar mm. of peace, the bottom half of that frieze that surrounds the altar is this huge kind of floral display. And, you know, from a distance, it looks like it's all these swirling leaves and, you know, very much fits into that. Everything's blooming at the same time. Time, and this is a fertile and abundant great period of golden age you know following the civil mm-hmm. wars but then if you look closer you notice that you know it may appear from a distance that everything is just spontaneous but there is a pattern to it there is order to these spirals you know everything mm-hmm. and everything's enclosed in you know nice geometrically framed friezes so you've got this idea that it's kind of an illusion of spontaneous growth, I think. But there's this kind of caref- very carefully constructed frame around it. And I think, so Augustus really, I think, gets to the heart of that idea of, you know, is otium an abundance? Is that a negative or a positive? And he's trying to harness it in the most positive way that fits in with his whole kind of ideology of rule in mm-hmm. general. Makes me think that... What's important is Mark brought that up about the civic nature of Mm. it, because the reason it's okay that they produce these places of leisure is because they're doing it for the people. Yes. For for the people at Rome who do not have leisure. And they are providing leisure for the, the people who have only a little leisure. And of course, if you think about the way that the histories are written, which is not the same as what happened, but the way the histories are written, Nero is the opposite. Mm -hmm. He provides a garden, but it's a garden for himself. Exactly. It's it's not civic, it's it's personal. And right in the centre of Rome. So like, that is like, you know, a very, very obvious example of he's using it for his own personal Mm -hmm. pleasure. And you can contrast that with earlier, Julius Caesar, very famously, he kind of gave his gardens like to the people in his in will. His will. And then, or, and Augustus, or whether or not yeah, he did, yeah. Augustus did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and Augustus very much builds on that. He, he takes mm-hmm. lots of green spaces that in the late Republic had either been mostly private or maybe semi-public to some extent. And he really does open them up a lot to the public. And he also mm-hmm. creates new green space as well particularly the campus martius we do very much get this sense that there was a kind of greenifying of that whole area and yeah again this idea of the civic and the public and the private Mm. and and it's okay if you're doing it for the people or at least giving the perception that you're doing it for the people get some of it exactly yeah Yeah. this this idea of that communal sense Mm -hmm. and, and that it's something that everyone can enjoy you know i think one one of the things that you know some authors like to you know moan about about the city is when we have this city countryside divide is that they say oh well I don't have a room for a garden anymore. Uh, Marshall says, all I've got room for is like a tiny, basically a window box, you know, <laughs> in my apartment for some flowers. Like this is why I need to this is why I need to leave Rome in his very dramatic kind of fashion. But but the evidence suggests that there were plenty of green spaces that were accessible to the public and kind of who provides them and when and who takes them away, I think is really interesting. Like you said, Nero, it kind mm-hmm. of encapsulates everything about him that he kind of takes over the entire city space. And then obviously, very famously, the Flavian Amphitheatre, the Colosseum, that's a very public space. It's then put where his villa once was so yeah. it's like a reclaiming of that space in some way back to the public mm-hmm. and so you see that for you know augustus while occasionally accused of luxury in small ways is yeah. essentially not you know it's so important mm-hmm. to his perception that he's he that their household is productive and all of those yeah. things whereas nero you know the central one of the central things yeah. that makes him a bad emperor is that he is personally it's self-indulgent yes. and so that matches entirely with this idea that he would have great gardens but they would and i know it's a villa but i mean it does have gardens yeah. it does have a uh, park space but yeah. it's personal therefore it's indulgent mm-hmm. as opposed to being being appropriate yeah and it's that that idea of yeah a- appropriateness uh, and where's mm-hmm. that line and i think i think different people can get away with different things as yeah. as is normal but 
it, it's 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 a really easy symbol, I think, to weaponize either either end of the spectrum, either the positive yes. or the negative. And so with Augustus, you see a very he's weaponized it in a very positive way for his own self image. Whereas for mm-hmm. Nero, we get the complete opposite of that. And, you know, on a more personal level, again, Pliny, he's utilizing these spaces in his descriptions as a means Mm -hmm. of self-representation to put across a positive aspect of his personality. So for him, it becomes this very Greek, learned, philosophical space. So I, I always find it interesting in literary descriptions of gardens, you know, what what is the person doing the description? What are they trying to put into that description? How are they trying to put themselves in that garden and what is it meant to represent for them? Yeah, because it's not even just about emperors, because if you think about Hadrian, Mm -hmm. you know, he has some gardens and some villas and, and, and while he's not represented as the best emperor, he's also not, he's not a monster emperor. He's not one of the bad emperors at all, but he somehow, but he doesn't, those garden spaces that I know of, and again, this is moving well outside my real expertise yeah. so i don't really know but i'm pretty sure that they're they're pretty much personal gardens they're personal villas they're personal gardens so he's not getting away with it by being civic minded but because he's as strongly associated with intellectual and yes. greek and literary yep. developments it's okay because they aren't then seen as just indulgent, which is also because because people liked him and he was a better emperor. Yeah. Because of it, course Nero was technically intellectual and <laughs> yeah, exactly. Greek loving too, but but he wasn't liked. <laughs> yeah, and and Hadrian a bit late for me as well in, ter- yeah. in terms of time space. But but yes, he, he is very much an example of, again, he buys into that very Greek idea um, of mm-hmm. the garden space and, and it becomes part of that whole you know, panhellenic, you know, intellectualism yeah. that he wants he wants to get across. So so yeah, and I I think it's just another example of you can kind of mold these spaces into okay, oh God, I'm gonna use another pun. They're ripe for like <laughs> imparting whatever you want onto them. Because because and I think because of that liminality, because of that ambiguity, you can play with them in these ways and utilize them for your own kind of specific goals and and aims in mind. So as a last thought or last question, to what degree do you, I was going to ask you about other stuff too, but we've talked so much about gardens and they're (laughs) lovely. So we'll have you back on some other time. (laughs) But gardens are, are, they really are a a really fascinating topic. How much have you looked at or do you look at or do you intend to look at some of the later focus and fascination with gardens? And here I'm thinking about the sort of 17th, 16th, 17th century English and French, but I know the English tradition better, flowering of horticultural yeah. works. You know, I'm, I happen to have a particular interest in John Evelyn, but that whole world of the the, the formal gardens mm-hmm. and the, the botanical, you know, the interest of the Royal Society in botanical yeah. things and that sort of stuff. Do you look at that for, for theorizing? Because they, they obviously do look back to the classical yeah. world, but do you look at that for theorizing about gardens at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I think as as my research, I think when you think about garden scholars, they kind of tend to come from one of two angles. You've kind of got, you know, more generalized, like landscape, architectural historian type scholars. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you've got people that come to gardens like me from a very specific kind of temporal or geographic region, for example. It's definitely something that I have tried to integrate into my own scholarship in this idea of how do I bring in those more kind of general garden philosophical debates onto the ancient world and you know I think it's always a challenge with that mixing of more modern theory with with Mm -hmm. ancient spaces because you know how how applicable are they? But I do think with, with gardens that there is a lot of potential for the this kind of transcultural type analysis, particularly because, you know, even within the Roman world, I'm dealing with many different types of space. So there, there's mm-hmm. nothing kind of wrong with bringing in kind of modern theory, modern lenses to analyze that. I mean, I particularly use modern spatial theory to think about the ways in which we conceptualize these spaces. I know that other people have done a lot more work on things like, like you said, the 17th, 18th century, you know, Italian gardens, this kind, you know, English gardens Mm -hmm. as well, and how they intersect. It's not something that I have included a lot in my current research, but I think as I move on, I really want to focus more on 
these kind of transcultural ideas and because I, I like to think a lot about how particular concepts maybe translate across different types of Roman garden spaces. So to kind of broaden that into, well, and how does a Roman garden then compare to later gardens, I think is something, you know, to consider. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm kind of particularly interested in, not as late as as you said, the 17th, 18th century. But I'm really interested in this transition from, you know, the kind of in Rome, a lot of the time, this idea of a boundary with a garden, it then leads to notions of transgression and this idea of, Mm. well, if you've crossed into this space, then once you're in there, you can maybe do things that you wouldn't be able to do elsewhere. So it becomes a space where, you know, certain transgressions are okay. Whereas we then have this kind of Christian conception with the Garden of Eden, paradise is where that different stuff is happening there. And in late antiquity, with this idea of kind of moving to kind of gardens and flowers and chastity, whereas in the Roman imagination, it can sometimes be very kind of sexual and overt with garden space. So I'm, I'm interested in thinking more about, well, how did that transition occur, the kind of pre-Christian, post-Christian idea of the garden? And like, moving into late antiquity I think would be an interesting angle to kind of think about yeah I was, I was thinking I mean that um, that's the other way um, to to go is that in the middle ages yeah. they obviously pick up on a lot of these notions mm-hmm. about the garden and really run with it both in the religious terms and the Christian terms yeah but also it becomes hugely important in in more secular material like the the courtly love tradition yeah. oh, okay. and what the garden means yeah. there. Mm-hmm. If you want to talk about a garden as a site of transgression mm-hmm. and as a site, uh, because like as literally a site of in both senses of the homonym, because it's where you see your lady walking and mm. you stand by, and the, the, the walled garden is yes. a safe space for the chaste lady to mm-hmm. be, Exactly, but it's also a place where she is open to be seen yeah. and to see and to interact. And so the, the crossing of the wall, right? Like I'm yeah. thinking of, there's a, there's a number of, stories that I can think of where seeing a lady walking in the garden or looking down from a tower and seeing yeah. someone, you know, it features really importantly. And it's important that it's a, a nominally safe space yeah. mm-hmm. and, an, and a nominally private space that is nonetheless open. Yeah. And, and it's it, keenly used in both the literary and mm-hmm. the visual arts. Yeah. In the Middle Ages, yeah. So. yeah. And that, that is exactly the same, like it operating in a different way, but those same overriding ideas, as you see in the Roman imagination, that, They've set up these boundaries, but specifically in order to then challenge various binaries and, you know, mm-hmm. you know chased, unchaste, all of all of these kind of <laughs> ideas. And I think I, I, I do find it really interesting. And I, and I guess it's a space where you can work out those ideas because mm-hmm. of its liminality and because of this sense of boundary crossing. And what does that boundary mean in different sets of circumstances? Is it simply physical does it become ideological Mm -hmm. where's the line between those two things and and you know etymologically going back to to terms the kind of old persian paradisa comes is formed from the two words which mean around and fence and from that we get the hellenized paradisos and then that's where we get paradise from which is very intrinsically linked to like the garden of eden this idea of paradise as a garden so we have these yeah, the, the language itself kind of maintains that idea of mm-hmm. the boundedness, the cultivation. Like if we look at all of the kind of origins of the various kind of European and proto-European words for garden, they all kind of maintain that sense of a boundary, you know, in the root of the actual word. Yeah, garden and yard, right? Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, I I mean, okay, I won't because we could go on forever now. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that, and because we didn't even touch on, say, Priapus and Garden. Yeah, exactly. Instance, yeah. Which is obviously where my mind goes yeah. when I'm a 12 year old. Yeah. But, you know, the God of Gardens and his threatening of, of trespassers yeah. with his giant phallus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, just mm. the very basic sense that the boundary, despite all that we've spoken about with in terms of like liminality and the ambiguous nat- mm. nature, this is why these boundaries, I think, are so interesting because that they're, they're encouraging liminality and ambiguity, but at the same time, 
the Romans see the boundary as so important that it has to be policed by Mm -hmm. a figure like Proclus Mm -hmm. and not just like any old figure like this is a very very like provocative symbol it's both productive and prohibitive you know Mm -hmm. yeah with the fact that it's a phallic symbol you know you've got those two aspects of fertility but also I mean he's literally kind of, of wielding it as a weapon right <laughs> like in yes, most of the exactly. statues uh, and you know the the poems centered on him you know they are not for the faint-hearted they are very cutting mm-hmm. and visceral you know about you know what's going to happen to you if you transgress so mm-hmm. it, it both it it's very his character is very interesting because he's like teasing you. He want he's inviting you to come in, but then he's also saying, "Well, yeah, but I'm going to make you get in here, but at the same time, I'm going to punish you." Um, after yeah, you and then that. his and then his punishment is a literal transgression of boundaries. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that is what he does to exactly. you to punish you. Is he transgresses the boundaries that shouldn't be transgressed? Yeah. So it, it you know, in he kind of embodies in just his very physical form that idea of yeah the transgression aspect Mm -hmm. of of that garden boundary so yeah I find it you know particularly interesting in the Roman imagination that there is this very visceral symbol of what will happen to you you know with transgression despite the fact that they then (laughs) clearly always represent it as a very liminal and ambiguous space they also Mm -hmm. really really want to defend that boundary at the same time yeah all right we could have this conversation forever (laughs) but (laughs) i think this is perhaps a good place to place the boundary yes um (laughs) all all the puns yeah (laughs) But thank you so much. Totally fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me. And we'll look forward to, yeah, I know that. So right now you have a book coming out yeah. or not coming out. That's perhaps a little preemptive. Yeah. Uh, oh, book so under contract. Book under contract, right. probably the end of um, end of next year, beginning of, t- what year are we now? So beginning of, I don't know. T- beginning of 2023, <laughs> I think. <laughs> right, right. So yes, I'll be working on it over the next year for, for yeah, it to come out after that. And Shortly, I have an article uh, coming out on Columella, actually, and Gardens in Selecta Classica. That should come Mm -hmm. out this month, I think, imminently. So, yeah, so that's exciting. And if people want to hear your uh, thoughts on on Gardens, but let's be honest, especially on memes and (laughs) (laughs) running and donuts, where could they find you? (laughs) So, yeah, so if you uh, want to maybe sometimes get some garden knowledge, but also knowledge about various things, uh, yes, I'm very active on Classics Twitter, uh, and it's at Vicky underscore Austin, spell A-U-S-T-E-N to be very uh, awkward. But yes, you can can (laughs) find me, you can find me on there and yeah, gardens and so much more. Many memes, uh, many <laughs> gifts as well. And lots about teaching and stuff. Lots about teaching, we haven't talked about, yeah. So, so, so yes, I, I have lots to say and hopefully you can find me there as well. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.